Hi there, welcome back. Welcome back to the rambling session, which is my version of the description of how this uh, audio circuit works on the Grundig 4006 stereo. I've got to warn you, this is my version of it. And <laughs> quite honestly, I'm going to be talking through it as I discover a lot of stuff here. So um, don't take this as gospel. Comments, corrections, criticisms are accepted. Now, let's have a look at this. What I've done here is I've actually placed names to the switches. I looked at the numbering on the switches. I looked at that uh, schematic down below, and I've actually labeled what the switches are. And the position the switches are in are in their default state. And the default state in this particular case is given as radio off, and that's it. So when you push, say, medium wave, it means that the medium wave will change the position of this particular switch, like that one there, right? Long wave will change that one. So we can actually go through it and take an example of the pickup input, the TA input, which is really what we want, and see what happens when that signal goes from here all the way through to the output to the speakers. Okay, let's get started. Now, if we look at the pickup input, what we have here is we've got three pins in here, and the uh, legend is here. TA1 is stereo right, so that's the right signal. TA2 is um, pickup, the pin 2 is ground, pin 3 is the stereo left, so that's left. But there's something uh, interesting here, and that is that this thing actually goes, if you take three and it goes from here, goes up to there. There's also a signal coming from this pin. And the same with this channel. You go from there to there, there's actually a connection coming from this pin. And there's a resistor going back here, and there's another resistor going down here. So if we look at the uh, TB connector, which is the tape deck, or tape recorder connector, what we find is that 3 and 5 are actually the inputs. And it says here, uh, mono input is pin 3, and it's also the stereo left, and pin 5 is uh, input stereo right. So that's your right signal, same as 1, which is your right signal, and there's your 3 left signal over there. So uh, it just means that your pickup has a resistor, whereas an actual direct line in, if you want to call it, would actually be uh, more correct coming from pin 3 and 5, of your tape input. So, what do we have here? If we look at the right signal, it comes out of there, goes up here, goes to there. It could also come from here, up there, goes to there. So your right signal is now in the system. It follows through to here, where it meets a resistor and capacitor network, but it also goes to this capacitor, and that capacitor is 10 nanofarad, so it actually allows fair amount of uh, audio through. It's a pretty big capacitor for audio. So that signal, most of it, goes through to there. What happens here? Why is this thing over here? And why does this thing sort of meet the other channel? Well, let's look at the other channel. This other channel comes into here. It could also come from here to there, and will go to that capacitor. That is the capacitor we said is actually quite big. So it'll go through to here, and it'll meet this switch. And this switch is the mono or stereo switch. Now the mono or stereo switch, switch, when it's in mono, that's the default state, it's actually closed. So it means that the signal can come straight through to here and meet that guy. And the two of them now go off together. That's our mono. What do these guys do? Well, to do that, we'll have to see what happens under stereo conditions. Because what's actually happening is that part of your right channel and part of your left channel are leaking through to the other channel. And let me show you what happens. If we look at this red signal, it gets here. It's going through, but it also gets to this network over here. And this network over here is a resistor, is a capacitor to ground, something happens there, some signal is leaked, 
And then it also goes on there and it meets this guy. And this guy is effectively the full blue signal or left signal. So when it gets to this point and it goes off to be processed, in this case to be shorted, it's, it's got a little bit of, it's got some of the red signal. So this here, at this point, is not just the blue signal. There's actually part of the red signal. Let's look at the blue signal over here. The blue signal gets to here. And as I said, a lot of it goes through that capacitor, but some of it actually goes to here and does the same thing. Some leaks to ground and some of it actually joins the red signal. And why is that? Well, it actually makes sense because when you have this situation where it's shorted, where your signal is actually a mono signal, though that doesn't make any difference whether you take the full signal and short it at that end or take part of it and take it through there. But here's where I'm going to go back a bit and I'm going to show you what happens when you have stereo selected. We'll actually start again. We'll take uh, this signal to here, to there, and it happily goes through to that point and to that point. But if we've got stereo selected, then that guy is actually over there. So our signals are not shorting in this case because stereo selected, activated. And our red signal, that one goes to there, goes to there, goes to there, through that capacitor, and it goes up to here. So now you see those signals aren't actually shorting. They're going off separately. But something is happening here. There is leakage at this point. This point is actually leaking through there. Some goes to ground. But some of it comes and joins the blue signal. And the same applies with the blue signal. Blue signal is here. And some of it goes through there. Some of it leaks to ground and some of it joins the red signal. Now, what is this joining that's going on here? Well, what you're actually getting is that part of your left signal is bleeding through into your right signal, and part of your left right is bleeding through to your left when they're working in stereo. And the reason for that is, I believe, got to do with the bass. In fact, I know it has to do with the bass, and I'll show you why. If we take that circuit and we put it into LT Spice. Now, this is uh, just an exercise in basically futility because it actually makes sense just looking at it. But I've created the input uh, signal coming in here as a voltage source. And um, I've given it a series resistance of 12K, which is the uh, resistor that you see between the uh, input of the pickup and that uh, break-off point where it meets that resistor capacitor network. And then it meets this resistor, which is 220K. There's a 3.3 nanofarad to ground. There's another 220K, and then it goes off. And I've actually just made this a load, call it 1 meg, 1000K. It could be more, doesn't make that much difference. And I simulate a frequency response on this. What we actually get is this. That is the frequency response of that circuit. Now that circuit is by no means absolutely the same as what we're getting on, the, uh, on that input, on that network we're seeing. But what it shows us is that it's letting through the, high the low frequencies and then it's cutting off the higher frequencies. So this is basically a low pass filter that is bleeding base frequencies into the opposite channel. And we can see that, what have we got here? We've got, uh, this is minus three, so we've got to go to minus six. Where is that? Minus six. A minus three dB point is at about 270 hertz. Now this, as I said, is a very simplified version of that circuit. But for this particular circuit that we're seeing here, that is the frequency response. So we know we've got a low pass filter that's actually bleeding base frequencies to the opposite channel. And that is for the uh, situation where you have stereo. And why would this be the case? Well, 
I think we'll find as we go further ahead that it needs the sum of the two base frequencies to basically drive the right amount of bass through the middle speaker, which is effectively a mono speaker. The bass comes through in mono and the treble comes through in stereo. So it needs to sum the bases together so that as far as bass is concerned, there is no stereo signal. Your bass frequencies are all going through as a summed signal, both to the left and the right. And we'll see that when we get further ahead. I just thought I'd do this. I like playing with uh, LT Spice every now and then. It's, um, it's actually something I don't use that often. Every time I use it, I've got to basically learn how to use it again. But it is interesting and it does help you solve some small conundrums that you run across. Let's carry on. So let's take the continuation of that mono signal drawing that we had. And this is what we have over here. And let's assume our mono signal has now been selected and it is going to that point over there. Now what happens with the mono signal is that we've actually got nothing going up here. There is nothing there, right? Why is that? What's happening here? Well, Let's see what happens to this triode if there's no signal going up here. So there's no signal going up here. That means there's nothing getting to the pot. That means that at this point there's no signal, no signal, no signal. And ultimately to that pot there, that one there was the bass control, that's the treble control. But ultimately that point there has no signal. So there's no input to the uh, triode, to this triode, this half of the ECC83. If there's no input, there's no output. Does it even get power? Well, let's see. Power should come from here. Could this be it? Yeah. There's our uh, supply voltage. That four microfarad capacitor filters that, uh, that version of the B+. And that goes up here, up here, along here to there. It then feeds that triode over there, which is understandable, goes to that point there, that anode. It also, at this point, goes up that through that resistor to that anode. So we know that these two are active. But what about the bottom one? Well, actually it is active because pickup has been selected and it is this point over here. So your, your B plus is getting through there, through that 330K, res, uh, 330K resistor here, to the anode. But there's no signal here to go through that capacitor because we have mono selected and mono is that point over there. Pickup has been selected, so it's actually changed the state of that switch, but that's made no difference. So that is the selected state of that switch. And that is the selected state of that switch. In fact, if we're doing pickup, we've got to actually put these in place. Open that one. See what I'm doing? I'm changing the states because where are the other switches? Because pickup, everywhere there's a pickup, I need to change the state. Like here. I think I've changed them all. Everywhere there's TA, which is pickup. I've changed the state of the switches. I think I've got that right. So basically what happens if we use mono, that triode is unused. That doesn't go to the power tubes at all because of the switching that's happening. Okay, what happens to the other channel? The one that we left off here? Well, that goes to here. And because pickup has been selected, this switch has moved down to here. This is the switch that chooses between pickup audio and radio audio coming from the top there. So that goes to there and that goes to there. One step further. That thing down here, if you look at that line coming down here, we won't even draw it, but it comes to the output of the tape. In other words, that is the signal that's being fed back to be recorded on your tape recorder. That's why that is there, okay? So we'll carry on going upwards. It's going up that way. 
our signal carries on up here and it gets to here and it meets a switch. Now what the hell is that switch doing there? Well, that is when you switch off, when you switch off the radio, that thing shorts. That, I've, I've explained before, it basically shorts the audio to ground so that once you switch off the radio, there is no audio to bleed through while the capacitors still have enough charge to keep your power tubes pumping. So you want it to go silent. Your voltage doesn't drop to zero immediately after you push off. But if you give it a short at the input, there is no audio to amplify. So your radio goes silent. But because we have the radio active, that switch moves to the side. And therefore, our audio can carry on going up here. And it gets to here. And it meets a capacitor and a variable resistor. Now, some of the audio goes straight through the capacitor. Okay? This is a 330 picofarad capacitor. It is sort of small, fairly small. Remember below we had 10 nanofarads? Well, this is sort of small. But how do you get more audio to go through, more frequencies to go through? You can actually just bleed it through a variable resistor. Let it go through that resistor as opposed to going through the capacitor. Now what happens if that variable resistor is at zero? If that wiper is touching there, then that capacitor is completely bypassed. That means all your frequencies get through. If that wiper is down at the bottom at 10 meg, which is a pretty high resistance, then very few frequencies, very little audio gets through that path and all of it has to go through that resistor, that capacitor, which means that only high frequencies get through. And you can alter the level of frequencies that go through, the amount of frequencies that go through, the amount of high frequencies going down to low by this position of the spot. That is your base spot. So depending on how small you make this setting, how shorted you make it, you allow more base or less base to go through. And that's what you've got over here. That's what is at this point. Then this sees another one of those. You think, bloody hell, when is this going to stop? Well, there's a while to go. This thing sees a capacitor and high frequencies want to go down to ground. But it also sees a resistor. So some of the audio bleeds through. Not much because that resistor is a pretty high value, 1 meg. Okay, and most of the audio just goes straight through. Most of that signal that's there goes through that 330k resistor and it gets to the first home base. That's where you want to get to. You want to get to the top of the pot. However, this thing here takes some of the um, bleeded audio or some of the bleeded highs, frequent high frequencies that have got through that, that capacitor, takes some of those and it does this. It feeds some of them back through another capacitor to that point, to home base, back to the top of the pot. So you're basically selecting which frequencies or how much of those high frequencies you are feeding through. You are shorting through to the top there, through that uh, capacitor. There's another capacitor here. This becomes a little bit funny because these pots are not normal pots. This has got a normal resistance to ground and your uh, wiper takes a signal from there to that capacitor. But then there's all these things. There are actually different tappings on that um, potentiometer with respective um, conditioning or tone shaping uh, sections here, which have to do with your perceived volume at different volume levels. Now, this is actually used on a lot of these radios. Depending on what volume level you're at, it suddenly meets another leakage point down to ground. For example, if, you, if you've got it down here very low, it'll suddenly meet another path where high frequencies can bleed to ground through that resistor and through that capacitor. There's a point over there where if the pot is at that point, then some of these highs actually bleed into there rather than coming through the top. 
and some of them bleed through this network, which is a high pass filter to ground as well. And depending on whether you've got hi fi desires or not, whether you've got uh, medium wave or long wave in there, you don't want high frequencies. Uh, you don't want a particularly broad bandwidth. So if you select medium wave, that opens, and select uh, long wave, that opens. So this is an OR circuit, either uh, medium wave or either, yeah, either medium wave or long wave can break this short of that resistor. If it's, uh, for example, if it's on uh, pickup or if it's on uh, FM, this resistor stays shorted. So the only leakage to ground is through this 220K shorts through gets leaked to ground. At that particular setting, at that particular point, wherever that is. Now this is a 2.2 meg potentiometer. That there could be at 2 meg. It could be at 1.8. I don't know. I'd have to desolder the whole thing to find out. I'm not that interested. Okay. There's actually, uh, I've done a lot of talk about this particular type of tone shaping circuit that they apply to the different taps on the uh, volume pot. So I won't go through all that again. Suffice to say, this is tone shaping to give you perceived uh, volume at different volume levels. It's a, it's a loudness control a la 1950s. Okay, enough of that. Our audio has got to that critical point, and that critical point is where it gets interesting because it goes through that capacitor. 22 nanofarads is quite big. It goes through that capacitor and it goes into the grid of that triode. That's half of the ECC83. And this is where the magic happens because now it's going to start dividing up to the different triodes and then push pulling through to the speakers. So here we are. We're at the uh, grid of this uh, triode. And what happens next? Well, the signal comes in here. That's just a grid leak. No biggie. Signal com comes in here and it gets amplified. This one is cathode biased. There's a bit more to be to said about this cathode biasing because it actually is linked to this cathode bias here as well. But that has to do with uh, whether it's mono stereo pickup or not. And also it does um, bring into effect the actual balance control over here. But let's look at this as a normal um, cathode biased triode amplifier. Signal comes in here. It gets amplified and inverted to the anode. So it comes out here quite a bit stronger, higher in value. It goes down here. Now, this resistor here is just the supply. This one here, 330. That is the supply that comes from here. Where is it? Well, yeah, it goes through there and it goes to B plus down here. So that is the uh, anode resistor that feeds supply to there. And we've already seen what happens to the bottom one. It actually does get a supply, but there's no signal, as we've said. So the signal is here now. What happens next? Well, where is it going to go? It's actually going to go down here. It goes down here, along here, gets to there, can't go to there. But it'll go through to here. It'll go to there. It'll go to there. And here we go. Here's our signal. And one tube, one output power tube, has already got a signal. It's got a grid stop uh, resistor here, 47K. It's got a 10 nanofarad capacitor here, which allows practically all the frequencies that have got to here to go through. It's got a um, grid leak of 1.8 meg. But other than that, this is just the supply, the signal to the grid of this EL95, which is a pentode. And it's going to amplify it and pass it through there. We'll see what happens then. But this signal here not only goes down there to that tube, but it also carries on. And it actually carries on to here, to here. That's just another grid leak, and to this tube. Now, what is this doing? Well, this is another triode. 
it's part of the ABC80. It's the triode in the EABC80. And this one actually amplifies that signal to a different degree. And the amount of amplification is actually controlled by effectively by this resistor and that resistor. That capacitor is effectively a, uh, an AC short, 3.3 nano, nearly. And it creates a uh, voltage divider. And what it's going to do is it's going to feed part of that signal, part of that signal, a proportion of that signal. In fact, what is this, 10 or 18? I think it's 18 over 18 divided by 2718, that fraction, into that grid. And why is it dividing it? Well, what it's actually doing is it's amplifying it as well. You see, it amplifies it as well, but it inverts it as well. So this signal then comes here. And what we find here is another situation where this thing here is just the, the supply. That is the anode resistor, and that's feeding power to the anode over there, to the plate. And that is just the audio signal, the inverted version of that audio signal, cut down in size, inverted, and that is ready to be fed into that guy. So what we've got now is we've got signal A, call this A. Signal A comes down here, boom, 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 and pushes that tube. In other words, that signal gets to that tube. A percentage of A gets to there, gets amplified, hopefully back to the amplitude of signal A. So you're dropping the level because you're amplifying the level and you're inverting it. So that there is minus A that goes to that tube. So these two tubes are getting opposite and equal. They're supposed to be equal. They probably are not, but they should get opposite and equal uh, signals to push and pull. That's where push-pull comes from. Now, the key is this. Whatever signal you have here that goes into here is going to get inverted and amplified. So you have to break down that signal. You have to amp uh, attenuate that signal here by the exact amount that you're going to amplify it there. Now, that is very complex. I mean, the amplification of this thing depends on the actual tube. It depends on the grid. Um, leak resistor. In other words, this is actually grid leak biasing. So it depends on how much this thing is going to bias that tube. It depends on the value of that capacitor, that resistor, that resistor, that resistor, the actual plate resistor. So for you to get this point here to be equal and absolutely equal and opposite to this point here is one hell of an exercise in jiggling around with those values because you don't even have the benefit of using two triodes that are in the same envelope. If you were using this guy to give you the opposite one, well, you know, at least that is the same. And you would amplify it direct, which is probably, and we'll see that in a minute, what it does with stereo. But in here, you're playing with some really strange, strange, strange um, calculations that have to all work out perfectly. You've also got this sort of feedback thing over here as well. Uh, I'm not even sure what that does. I'm sure someone can tell me. I'm not even sure what that does. But anyway, what happens here? This signal is pushed through there, through that transformer. This thing here is supposed to cut down on high frequencies. And as I said, I can't find it anywhere on the um, radio itself. But that pushes through there, and that pushes, in, in turn, induces the audio on that speaker. Um, that's the, what is that? That's the left or right. I don't even remember which way around it is. There's something else to do with feedback here, but we'll see that in a minute. So that pushes that one. But the same signal that's getting pushed through there, and why is it getting pushed? Well, where's the supply from this guy coming from? Well, it's actually coming from down here, from there. Supply goes up here, into there, into there. 
and then it feeds through there, through that primary, through that primary to that one. So effectively, the audio that is generated here is generated across both of those coils, both of those primaries, okay? And in this particular transformer, it's only happening with the one signal, in other words, that one. So that thing generates the audio on that speaker. It also becomes part of the audio that's pushing and pulling this one, which is a uh, push-pull transformer, because whatever signal comes in here is also coming in there, inverted. So this push-pull action on this transformer drives that speaker, the base speaker. And this uh, resistor capacitor network is actually passing through the high frequencies. Uh, yeah, high frequencies. So it actually has a cutoff point so that this part of the transformer and that part of the transformer only um, actually allows certain frequencies to go through because the others can very easily escape through here. So we don't get high frequencies being generated on this transformer, or not many, because they are being generated up there and down here. So that makes sense. And um, in fact, if anything, there is something strange here. And I may be wrong. No, I'm not wrong. You see, if you wired this transformer exactly the same as that transformer, then what you'd get is that in the case of mono, the signal being generated through here would have one phase and the signal being generated through here would have the opposite phase. So what they've done is they've actually wired it in antiphase, I think, yeah. You see, in this particular case, the ground is at the top. And in this one, the ground is at the bottom. Uh, I mean, you can draw it any way you like, but what I think this indicates is that the phase of these two is reversed so that it can compensate for the fact that whatever signal you got coming in here is reversal, it's the reversed version of whatever signal is coming in here. So they actually reverse the output so that the speakers, in the case of a mono signal, you should get exactly the same effect from the speakers. If you put this speaker next to that speaker and you start pumping a signal, low, well, as low frequency as you could possibly see, then you should see this cone come out and this one come out at the same time and then move back at the same time and out at the same time. In other words, the pushing and pulling of air should be synchronous, should be the same. And if you wire those transformers, that one and that one, in, the, in a way that um, it didn't take that into consideration, then if you put these two speakers together, you get this one pushing while that one's pulling air. That one's pulling air, that's pushing air. And that would have the two channels fighting each other which could be an interesting effect because they're actually facing opposite directions, but you don't really want that. So other than the complexity, if that, of these uh, transformers, which is actually quite simple, because as we saw, the signal goes in here, it induces the audio on that transformer, it comes through here, the high frequencies escape, but the low frequencies induce the audio in that transformer, in one phase, and then the same thing happens here, where it induces in that one, through there, through there, through there. And that's how you get your push-pull. It's actually, it's actually pretty simple. Um, just one more thing. These two uh, power tubes, they are cathode biased. The two cathodes, if you see here, that cathode and that cathode is wired together. Those are wired together. They go through a resistor, which is 180 ohms to ground. So it's cathode biased. And then there's the cathode bypass of 50 microfarad. So the bias current, or rather the current, that flows into that tube and into that tube, or into that anode and into that anode. Remember, it's coming from here, goes there. DC current I'm talking about. Flows through there, goes through there. And it's got to go somewhere. It can't come out of the grid. So it goes that way and it goes through that resistor to ground. It creates a voltage drop across there. And because the ground is, the grid is effectively at zero volts, 
it creates a negative voltage between the grid and the uh, and the anode and the cathode sorry so you get the biasing and that just um, that acts as a cathode bypass pass so it's effectively short to ground for ac signals and it increases the gain of that as well but that's a different story we're just looking at the switching and all that that happens here so i think it's pretty clear now there are a few other things like this thing here has got another winding this base transformer has got another winding and that winding is connected to ground there and it comes through here goes there and let's follow it goes up here goes through a 22k resistor to this point and then this one is also coming from here through another resistor 5.6k resistor to this point the same applies at the bottom that point where does that go well that comes along here along here along here and it actually goes to the cathode now whatever signal you add or subtract to the cathode is going to change the bias condition of that tube and it's actually going to change the gain of that tube so you're getting it if you've got a signal going up here and part of it comes here uh, as negative feedback then that signal gets reduced or rather the effect at the end gets reduced so it's a feedback system and this is used primarily for uh, noise reduction in other words distortion reduction it does reduce the gain significantly but there is a fair amount of negative feedback it comes from both of the transformers there's the one and there's the other and it goes to both um, power tubes this is the other one here boom 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 to there and that my friends is the mono function and this thing's going on for ages so i'm going to cut it here and i'll probably do a quick short one again on the stereo function because this is really dragging on the other one is going to be a lot shorter promise you right i hope i haven't made too many mess ups on this i'm sure you'll tell me if i did and i would appreciate that because every time i do one of these uh, <laughs> lectures that's a joke Every time I do one of these uh, analyses, I'm basically learning and figuring it out for myself um, because I find these things interesting. And there's always something I overlook or misstate. And there are a lot of people out there who actually have a hell of a lot more experience and knowledge here than, than I do. Um, and I do appreciate it when I get some constructive com comments because they help me too. So that is it for now. Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed that. If you have, click like. If you haven't, you're asleep. So this video will come to the end without you clicking anything. In fact, you probably left your computer on. But um, I hope to see you back soon. And thanks for watching. Bye for now. Stay safe.